Let's talk about SmackDown, April the 12th, 2024. I did not go, by the way, to SmackDown here in Detroit. Um, I'm on the fence about whether I should have gone or not. I'm actually kind of glad I didn't go. It's kind of cold and rainy outside. Anyway, we're going to do news and notes. But news and notes is just basically Ronda Rousey complaining, belly aching about stuff. Not much else to talk about, really. Um, so let's talk about that. Ronda Rousey. Uh, she, of course, she said that wrestling is scripted. It's not a real sport. And I got some people all tied up in a knot. There's no reason to go down that road. We know what it is already. It's kind of silly. But she did say something that I thought was worth discussing. And it is also quite kind of silly. That she wishes she had more time to rehearse. Like WWE does with Logan Paul. So she says, quote, and this is on the uh, subject of Logan Paul. He's great on the mic. He does a great job on the mic. I wish I was allowed the time to rehearse that he gets. It's not evenly spread. He's like their next big star. They are rolling out the red carpet. It goes to show that if you give people the time to rehearse and the resources, you can do amazing things. It's frustrating that everybody doesn't get that treatment. My first match with them was incredible because we had six weeks to rehearse. All the best minds in the business coming and putting their two cents in, and it was an instant classic. Then they never did it again. I was like, why isn't this the model? They're doing that with Logan Paul, and he's having these fantastic performances. Look what you guys can do when you actually put organization and effort into things. It blows my mind that this is a billion-dollar company. is succeeding in spite of itself in so many ways. Because, Ronnie, they have 300 matches a year. You cannot rehearse for six weeks <laughs> for a match. What is wrong with you? If you were only going to have uh, six matches a year, then maybe. If you was only going to work once or twice a year, then maybe. You know, The Rock had a quote-unquote training camp that was 12 weeks for his one match at WrestleMania, which is why he looked so good doing it. And... She's like, oh, they, they have my match was six weeks of training. Yeah, six, no, rehearsal. Six weeks of rehearsal. Let me get that correct. Rehearsal. The Rock tried to cover it up and say training camp. It was really rehearsal. This is rehearsal she's talking about, too. Who in the hell is going to rehearse for six weeks so you can have a match with Alexa Bliss? Be real, Ronnie. Get real. <laughs> you decided to be full time on the roster. There's no time for all of that, right? You got to have some natural instincts. Now, in terms of Logan Paul's uh, verbal abilities, I think he just has a high verbal IQ and he's just easily to dis easy to dislike. And as you know, as people who podcast, sometimes they typically do have a high verbal IQ. They can talk very well. Um, they can speak very colorfully. They can, uh, you know, inject personality into things that they say. When you're not really that then you typically end up like ronda rousey which is stiff as a board in terms of your personality and look and a lot of athletes are like that because they put a lot of effort into the physicality they don't put a lot of effort into the personality because the personality doesn't matter not as much it matters you know in the united states because we invest in personalities even in boxing and mixed martial arts etc a guy could lose every fight if he has an interesting personality like a chael sonnen you know, that guy never was a champion, but he can hold a podcast. He can hold a YouTube channel. People will always pay to see Chelsea Sonnen fight because he's entertaining. He's an entertaining personality. For a long time, Tito Ortiz was the same way. Um, even when he got, you know, his brain scrambled a little bit. That, that's what matters. Uh, Ronda Rousey is basically like, they didn't give me the same resources they gave to Logan Paul. Well, that's too bad. You, you, we're not giving you a training camp for a match on Raw. No, we're not giving you eight weeks to prepare for a match with Nia Jax. Just come on, you know. What is? And then you have to work house shows. That's what house shows are for. House shows are you for to try things out and work things out in front of a smaller audience. She then later she uh, also in another interview she said that she doesn't like working in stadiums. She would prefer to do indie stuff if she wants to keep wrestling. And, okay, I don't think she wants to keep wrestling, though. I think she just wanted to do some stuff with her friends, or she might do a blood sport or something like that, but I don't think that she's going to hang around too much. She's burning a lot of bridges. 
talking a lot of trash about a lot of people, whether it's earned or not. But it's just very bizarre that she would go this route. Be for real, Ronnie. All right, let's get into SmackDown because uh, we can't spend all our time on Ronda Rousey. Cody Rhodes, he came out there and said a whole bunch of nothing. Basically said that uh, what The Rock gave him was something he once gave to The Rock. And uh, he's going to be waiting for The Rock when he comes back. Then he says he's going to be facing one of these six men tonight. Cause I, and I didn't know what this meant. And then I found out it's a tournament. Hey, we're going to bring back King of the Ring and Queen of the Ring. Yay, but we're going to have tournaments every other week anyway. Huh? Yeah, we're doing that. Triple threat match tournament. That's what we're doing here. Jesus H. Christ. He said that himself and AJ Styles were the only two men to be the NWA and WWE world champion. Ric Flair. Hi. Ric Flair. Now, I guess he meant actively on the roster. Which, uh... I guess it's fair because he they are the only two on the active roster who have been NWA champion and WWE champion, but Ric Flair is literally right there. And then he says that Kevin Owens is his friend, but Kevin Owens thinks that he's better bell to bell, and there's only one way to find that out. And uh that was pretty much it. He he talked about The Rock a little bit. He talked about this triple threat thing. He mentioned payback or uh, backlash or whatever they're calling it, and he was gone. So there's that. The, uh, the blood, nothing. Uh, no heat, nothing. Just nothing, whatever. Uh, we, we're basking in the glow of Cody now. That's what we're doing. We're basking. Just come out there with the belt, show it off, let people announce him as being the champion. And that's pretty much it. Just bask in the glow. The bloodline. Oh, brother. Ooh -wee. We don't talk about that next. Let's we'll talk about that after this. So the tournament idea. Um, L.A. Knight, Santos Escobar, Lashley, uh, Rey Mysterio, AJ Styles, Kevin Owens. So it's two triple threat matches. The winner of which will, of each match rather, will wrestle next week. And that winner will wrestle Cody Rhodes at Backlash. So the first match was LA Knight, Santos Escobar, and Lashley, which dissolved into a whole bunch of chaos when all the factions started getting involved. Lashley's boys is involved. Santos boys are involved. And there's people jumping all over the place. You kind of forget who's in the match at that point. LA Knight ends up pinning Santos Escobar. Now, um, with the BFT. Santos Escobar, his story wasn't over, though, because part of the story of the night was Santos Escobar promising that the El Gabo del Fantasma had nothing to do with the attack on Dragon Lee. To which, this connects with the other match, where Ray says that Santos is suffering some karma. That's why, you know, him losing was karma. And that uh, Carlito says that Santos is cap, as the kids say. He's capping about attacking Dragon Lee. Rey Mysterio thinks that he can be champion again. And uh, we get to the promo segment with AJ Styles, which was pretty good. Um, he's focused. He's angry. He's pretty mad. Big mad and swole. I mean, AJ Styles is both mad and swole. I don't think he's missing in a good theme song. And then we get Kevin Owens, because he Kevin Owens wants to break the fourth wall again. And he wants to do the long camera shot. He picks up the uh, Detroit Tigers baseball championship belt thing. He flicks the CM Punk t-shirt off the stands, because uh, him and CM Punk still don't get along. <laughs> That's an interesting bit. And how could he, when he's such good friends with the Young Bucks, and... Uh, it's amazing how this thing is going to work out. Because Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are good friends with the Young Bucks. And CM Punk is currently embroiled in a thing with the Young Bucks. Hmm. But I guess everybody there is going to be forced to be professional. We're not going to dissolve into nonsense. Anyway, Kevin Owens wants to talk his way to the ring, but he ain't saying nothing. Just talked about how his son is not an uh, idiot, despite being taller than him, like Dominic is to Ray. And then he said that's not Ray's fault. Which, what was the point of bringing it up? Anyway, they have the match with a fantastic finish. 
Kevin Owens, Rey Mysterio, AJ Styles. There's an Avalanche Styles clash. A top Kevin Owens with a roll through into the pin. So AJ Styles pins Rey Mysterio, wins the match. And that will be LA Knight versus AJ Styles in a WrestleMania rematch. Next week on SmackDown, the winner of which will wrestle Cody Rhodes at Backlash. Um, it seems to me that AJ Styles is going to win this match. And we're going to get AJ Styles versus Cody Rhodes. And I like that idea. I like it. Um, look, LA Knight, you don't want to put Cody, who is a babyface, the biggest babyface in the company. Now he's your world champion. Why split the audience by putting another baby face in the match? I just don't see the benefit to that. So you go with the heel, even though it's 50-50 booking. And if you just wanted to do AJ Styles versus Cody Rhodes, man, maybe he should have won at WrestleMania. But they're going to put him over on SmackDown. And then you could always do the, the rubber match between Knight and Styles at some other point in time. So I'm going to go with AJ Styles winning that match. And AJ Styles and Cody Rhodes in the main event in France. I like that idea. You know, that's that's pretty good. Can't be mad at that. Um, if L.A. Knight wins, I will question what the hell they're doing with Cody Rhodes and why they're doing that. All right, let's get into this bloodline thing, because uh, we're at bloodline Wolfpack bloodline 3.0 uh, bloodline 2000. So Solo Sokoa is seething that Cody Rhodes is nameplate is on Roman Reigns' locker room door. And Paul Heyman is like, well, that's the champ's locker room. When we lost the title, we lost access to this locker room. You know, um, and Kevin Owens is in there and tells them to leave. They got to get out of here. And the only way for them to get back into this locker room is they got to they gotta win that belt back. So they go to the ring. Paul Heyman says there's no excuses for WrestleMania and accountability matters. Everybody needs to be held accountable, and the tribal chief wants to hold everybody accountable. He starts talking about uh, WrestleMania 39, where Cody took his eye off the ball um, and was looking for Solo. That's how he managed to lose this year. Roman took his eye off the ball, and he un ended up losing by focusing on Seth Rollins. So, as Paul was talking, Solo stopped him, and... Earlier in the night, when they were outside the dressing room, Paul Heyman said that uh, wins and losses matter around here. We lost the championship. We lost access to this locker room. And so Solo said, wins and losses matter, right? And Heyman's like, well, yes, obviously. This is obvious. And uh, there's consequences to losing, right? Yes, that's, that's, you know, that's what it means for something to matter. So then he said there was times for things to change. And he approached Jimmy. And uh, it looked at first like he was going to attack Jimmy. And then he hugged Jimmy. Told Jimmy that he loved him. Jimmy, you know, pat him on the back, loves him too. Jimmy did the old open hand, waiting for the dap. Solo just turned his back. And then Jimmy was attacked by Tamatanga. Tamatanga and Solo Sokoa then proceed to beating the dog shit out of Jimmy Uso. Samoan spikes, you know, uh, hip attacks with chairs into the face just really did him dirty. And Paul is in the corner absolutely almost if he could kneel and be in a fetal position, he would be. Um, he's forced to come over as Tomatonga and Solo put their fingers up. He's forced to come over and join them. He's intimidated. He's saying, this was not chosen by the tribal chief. This is not what the tribal chief wanted. Hmm. Then Solo knocks the phone from Paul Heyman's hand. The, the phone that he's been using to call Roman Reigns. And he stomps it. Solo stomps the phone so Paul Heyman cannot contact Roman. And uh, Solo and Tomatonga menacingly force Paul Heyman into their corner. Um, this is this was something. This was something. Later on, Paul goes to check on Jimmy because somebody's got to. Somebody's got to care about this guy. And then while he's outside the dressing room, he's uh, his eyes are red. He's a flutter. He doesn't know what to do. 
And Tamatanga walks up to him and says that this was by order of the tribal chief. And Paul is like, ah. he's not sure what they mean by this. <laughs> and Solo Sokoa is there too. And he also stares down Paul Heyman, who is frightened. So we got a couple of question marks here. You know, um, is Solo, the who is the enforcer of the bloodline, by the way? Is he the one meeting out the punishments? Is it the issue where, you know, um, guys fail and Solo has to, to handle it? Much like in the in the mob, you know, he might he had to he had to go to the, the mattresses on his own brother. Which, you know, he has no problem doing because he did it to Jay. Or is it a situation where Solo is going rogue and he's forming his own bloodline? And that's the question that's been that's just kind of floating out there. We don't know if this is Solo doing his own thing and then lying and saying that Roman Reigns is is the, is the guy behind this or whether this really is Roman behind this and he's just sick of Jimmy and he's ready for Jimmy to go away. Now, a lot of people have said, OK, this is going to be the Rock's bloodline versus Roman's bloodline. And. That is entirely possible. I like that idea. And it could be that the tribal chief that Solo Sokoa and Tamatanga is talking about is not Roman Reigns, but High Chief Siuli, who is The Rock. And is it that, you know, The Rock has decided... He doesn't need the Usos, or he just doesn't need Jimmy Uso, and he doesn't need Roman. He could bring in Tamatanga and Solo, and of course Jacob Fatu, and have his own version of the bloodline. And obviously, this is going to lead to Roman and the Usos being baby faces against probably Solo, Tama, and Jacob Fatu. I love that. This is just. This is, there's money falling out of the sky on this one. All right. Um, it's just, it's a lot of cash to be made in this situation. I mean, it is kind of absurd that Tama Tonga is taking orders from Solo Sokoa because, you know, Tama Tonga is like, what, like 10, 15 years older than Solo Sokoa and much more experienced in the business. But whatever. And Solo's been only been on TV for two years. Which is what tells me that he's probably not the head of this thing and that he's taking orders from The Rock. Um, and that would be, that would make more sense. But they also set up uh, Solo Sokoa to be the, the tribal heir. That if something was to ever happen to Roman, it was going to be up to Solo Sokoa to lead the bloodline. And now Roman is, I guess you could say he's on hiatus. And Solo's taking over and doing his own thing. And that's why this thing is fresh and it's interesting because you don't know if Solo has gone rogue because he doesn't talk that much. And since Roman is not there, we don't know what Roman is saying. Uh, Paul is kind of on the outside and he is the wise man who usually knows everything and knows what's going on. But he is extremely surprised by this. So we got these rogue elements with Solo and Tama Tonga, and I like the pairing. I think Tama Tonga works in the bloodline. I know he's he's not. Look, when it comes to these Polynesians, they're so tight. They might as well be family. You know, Haku is not blood related to the Fatus or the Anawais, but he's a Polynesian wrestler. He tag team with them for a long time. Um, they know each other very well. He fits. He's kind of like, you could say a distant cousin. <laughs> you know, okay. Um, and nobody cares anyway. All right. Nobody gives a shit. So, Tama Tonga, they even bringing him in as Tama Tonga, which is fine. Um, was a, he was spoiled before the show, which was, you know, it was, it is what it is, but it was a great uh, introduction for him, for people who don't know him. Uh, him just being a brown skinned guy hanging out with the other brown skinned guys. He's a member of the bloodline. They're not going to ask any questions. 
All right. <laughs> just going to be like, oh, OK. But again, a lot of those Polynesian wrestlers, they consider like Jimmy Snooker to be family. Jimmy Snooker is, is Fijian. He's not related to any of these people. But again, Polynesian wrestlers, they all work together. They have, they have been tag team partners and friends forever. So you get, you know, that that level of trust and you get to basically pick your own family. These people are our family. So Tama Tonga fits. And uh, he he looks great. He's in phenomenal shape. He was in phenomenal shape in, in Japan. Um, and this is going to, this thing is going to work out wonderfully. You know, this is going to be a real great story. Hopefully it doesn't run too long and it doesn't get to the point where it does become like, you know, NWO Wolfpack and NWO Hollywood, where it just seems there's no end in sight, you know. Um, but then again, there's only there's not that many more active bloodline members out there. Um, I know you're talking about Hikuleo and Tongaloa and Zilla Fatu and Lance and Hawaii. They're all floating around out there. I know. Um, and then there's another, there's other Polynesian wrestlers that I probably can't think of off the top of my head, but I don't think they're going to expand it to that degree. You know, I see them utilizing the Tama solo and Jacob Fatu as underlings for the rock. And then you're probably going to have Roman and the Usos on the other side. And of course, if they need an extra person, you got the honorary Us and Sami Zayn. Or you could go out there and get Umaga's son, Zilla Fatu, or, you know, somebody like that and, and bring him in. If that's what you want to do. He's very green, though. Like, he's really just getting started in wrestling. So I wouldn't probably not do that. But it's a, it's a great story because when you have like these empires and or these organizations and the leadership crumbles, then it, as they say, nature abhors a vacuum. Roman has created a vacuum for the most part since he lost the belt. There has to be consequences is what they're saying. Consequences for losing solo. People are counting all of his, uh, you know, house show losses, but the last big win was him over John Cena, you know? And I think he's probably lost a match since then. I think he got beat by Jay or something since then. I think, I think he got beat by Cody or somebody since then. But he hasn't been, you know, losing a lot on television, let's say. So he has some level of credibility. And because he's the enforcer and the badass, he could always just give him credibility later. And it, it could work. But I don't think Solo as the star works. Solo is a henchman. You know, he doesn't have enough personality to be the f the front man of the bloodline, which is why I know that either this is Roman's plan was to get rid of Jimmy to force the Usos back together. Or this is the rock one or the other, because I don't think Solo is the guy you want to have leading the faction. Right now, he just doesn't seem to have the personality to make it work. But I love what I'm seeing here. I love what it sets up. You know, you can see the Survivor Series match already. You can see WrestleMania already. I know that Meltzer is saying, oh, that The Rock would rather work with Cody at WrestleMania than Roman and all this bullshit. Get out of here. Don't listen to that. Don't pay no attention to that. <laughs> Don't pay no attention to that. Um. If he does wrestle Cody, it'll be before WrestleMania. But I don't think so. Um, but this is going to be great. You know, and the way they've set it up, it works perfectly fine. Paul is stuck in the middle. You know, he's not sure which direction he needs to go in. And he's out of the loop. You know, and he's the one, the perspective guy. He's the guy that we're we're all like, okay, Paul has always pointed us in the right direction because Paul always knew. You know, Paul always had an idea of what was going to happen. Now he is, it's chaos and he doesn't know what's going on. So now he is as confused as we are because Paul, again, was our North Star. He, you, We knew what was going on through Paul. Now Paul doesn't know, we don't know. And that could be very interesting. 
over the next couple of weeks. Um, but now that they've killed Jimmy, my thing is, what are they going to do next? They got to kill Jay? They going to kill Jay too? Um, so that ought to be interesting. You know, The Rock's not around. Roman's not around. How are they going to introduce Jacob Fatu into this thing? Um, and who are they going to fight? Because, they again, they just killed Jimmy. So who are they going to fight? I don't know. And that's going to be an interesting thing. They got to get heat on somebody. Because none of these people are talkers except except Heyman. So what are you going to do? And I know some people might say, well, Jacob Fatu could be the leader of this thing. And I think he's entirely too new to the WWE audience to to have that kind of label. You know, you got to give us some time, give some people some time to get used to him. But I love the bloodline story. It's tremendous. They're doing a great job. All right. Uh, Brian Breaker with a shitty new theme defeated Cameron Grimes. Yay. Cameron Grimes is on TV. Stop the clock. But this uh, this theme that they made for Brian is absolutely shitty. And uh, people are starting to catch on that the Death Rebel themes are not only shitty, but they're repetitive. And that there's always we're going to announce who's coming out or we're going to put a catchphrase or something out there. It's terrible. It's truly a bad era for me. Like there is no new era until this music thing is fixed and it needs to be fixed post haste. Um, OK, Bailey comes out there. She we're basking in Bailey as well, except for now they're actually starting to put forward uh, something new. She uh, was talking about the championship. She was looking absolutely delicious in them tights. Absolutely delicious. That woman's fine. You know, she's not pretty, but she's fine. Tiffany Stratton interrupted her and accepted Bailey's open challenge that she did not make. Bailey had no open challenge. She really just wanted to challenge Naomi to a match. Tiffany Stratton is like, oh, oof, I, she already beat Naomi. Which is facts. She beat Naomi, what was this, like three or four weeks ago? Maybe five weeks ago? So Naomi talked about how she earned everything and she's going to earn everything again. And that, you know, it's flattering that Bailey wanted to fight her, but she can't accept Bailey's challenge yet because she has to beat Tiffany Stratton because Tiffany Stratton did win. So then they had the match and Naomi won the match with a jackknife pin. So it wasn't like she flattened tiffany stratton and it kind of had to happen i wasn't a big fan of it but it had to happen if you're going to put naomi in a championship match and it's going to be on tv next week fine then tiffany had to lose but i would prefer if she if she wasn't losing i would prefer if she was wasn't losing to naomi which is 50 50 booking because she just beat naomi which is weird it's extremely weird but naomi and bailey why would you do two baby faces? This is where you probably should have utilized one of your mid card heels. Tiffany Stratton is going to be one of your upper level heels. I wouldn't even use her, but this is where you would use somebody like a Piper Niven or a Chelsea green, or, you know, there's gotta be some other woman I'm thinking of, you know, the Zoe Starks or something like that. That would be a, a TV challenger for Bailey, right? Why split the audience by putting Naomi out there? I don't know. They're not thinking. But speaking of Chelsea Green, she's out there buttering up Nick Aldis, saying that Nick uh, Adam Pierce is the one who left her off WrestleMania. She knows that Nick Aldis is smarter than that. And she gets an opportunity, her and Piper Niven, who, Piper, she's in and out. She's there sometimes. She's not there sometimes. I don't know what's going on. Um... And they decided they're going to get them a tag team match. And their opponents were Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair. Because they're a tag team now. So you know where this went. Josie Green's face in the mat. Uh, Jay licking her fingers. So there that goes. It's great. Uh, it's working out just fine. All right. Uh, they did a vignette for uh, Grayson Waller and Austin Theory because they weren't in the building. Uh, then all this set up a fatal four-way tag match which is the same teams that we've been seeing forever. Ugh, ugh. And you know Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate was involved with this. Oh, my word. Have mercy. They suck so bad. Oh, they suck so bad, man. Feels bad. Anyway, 
you know they're probably going to end up winning this thing. But Grayson Waller and Austin Theory not being there to, you know, celebrate their own victory, which, you know, they're probably selling the, the injuries from the match or whatever. It's fine. Um, I'm just not a fan of these. We're going to hot shot the, the, the championship matches all over again, but tournaments and fatal four ways and triple threats and just build things, man. Just build things appropriately. Have somebody call them out. And then they maybe win a bunch of matches. They beat some jobbers or something. And then they get a title shot. You know, I like what they did with the Bailey situation where Bailey was going to make a direct challenge to Naomi. And Naomi's like, oh, I just lost to somebody. So I got to go ahead and beat them. And then I'll get right back to your title shot. You know, um, but and this, this episode was all about the bloodline stuff. Um, the, the championship matches, you know, the number one contender stuff. Eh, I, I don't care about that crap. A lot of it is the same guys we've been seeing for the last month or so. Santos Escobar, who I don't know when the last time he won a match. You know, um, Kevin Owens lost his last match. Somehow he's in this. Um, <laughs> you know, like AJ Styles lost at WrestleMania. He was still in this. How about you reward winners? You know, why not put winners in this thing? But I, I get the point. You know, I just wanted to get to LA Knights versus AJ Styles in a rematch. Um, other than that, the Bloodline stuff dominated the show, and I thought that was great. But let me know what you guys think. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Bongo Slate. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>